everybody. Let's get ready for another day. Take your seats. Put your phones and devices on silent if you would. Remember to do that. Thank you. I hope you all had a good evening last night. I know I did. Lots of good sharing going on. We're going to get right to business and introduce our this morning's speaker. It's my pleasure to introduce an expert in the field of social selling, Corey Perlman. He's an entrepreneur, author, and nationally recognized digital marketing expert. Corey is the owner of eBoot Camp Inc., a team of highly skilled digital marketing specialists who manage the social media accounts for over 40 companies. Social media overload, no, let's say that again. Social Media Overload, his latest book, is an Amazon.com bestseller in every major business category. He's a top-rated keynote speaker for companies big and small, including Cisco Foods, Dale Carnegie, KTM Motorcycles, Medical Solutions, and now NARPA. He's a proud member of the National Speakers Association and a Dale Carnegie High Impact Presentations graduate, a native Floridian, fan of small batch bourbons, and father of two small children who is desperately trying to keep off of Instagram and Snapchat. Please welcome Corey Perlman. Thank you, Jennifer. I appreciate it. Thank you. That was awesome. Hey, everybody. How's it going? I uh, first just want to thank you all for, for being here this morning. We're in Vegas. It's fairly early. I'm from the East Coast, so it's kind of mid-afternoon for me. But um, there's a lot of places that you guys could be, but you chose to be here. And I don't take that lightly at all. So for the next hour or so, my goal is to give you real-world best practices and social media that we've seen over the last seven or eight years of doing this with my agency that will help you find more houses, find more apartment buildings, things of that nature to be able to help grow your business and such. Uh, just a couple of housekeeping notes to start with. For questions, uh, if you have something that per pertaining to something exactly I'm talking about, I don't mind if you raise your hand, but I know we're going to use Slido uh, at the end. So if you want to, you guys got some practice with that yesterday, so you can uh, use the, that, that app to get your questions in so we can have that at the end. Uh, a lot, the, one of the number one questions I get about my PowerPoint is, can you have the slides? And the answer is yes, and I will show you how to do that at the very end of the presentation, okay? So you can have my slides, so you can kind of lay back, don't worry about scribbling or taking pictures of every slide. If you want to, you're more than welcome to do so, all right? So we're going to go ahead and get started. So as mentioned in the intro, uh, not only am I a speaker, but we own an agency called eBootCamp, and we've been doing this for about seven or eight years. So everything I'm about to talk about has been tested for you guys. Some of the things that we've done in the past have failed. That's not here. And then some of the things that have worked really well is what I put into our presentations, okay? So since you guys are owners and decision makers with your companies, the first thing I want to do is provide a little context when it comes to social media. So... This is sort of what I consider our secret sauce, this, this pyramid here. This is everything that we do in social. If it doesn't fit into one of these categories, we consider it a hobby and we don't do it as businesses or as marketers. So let's go through each of these. The top one is generating leads. This is people who have homes, have small apartment communities, whatever the case may be, and they don't know who you are, but they're looking for a business or a property management company like yours. This is getting them to come to your business. Okay, that's the generating leads part. That's kind of the obvious one. That's the one that we all want, but it's only the tip of the iceberg, so to speak, on what social can do for you. So obviously what we're looking to do is generate leads through digital and social media. The second level, and the one we often miss, is building credibility. So now they've found you, but now they're checking you out online. They're seeing if they want to do business with you guys. They want to poke holes in your credibility, see if there's anything that they need to be concerned about. So these are things like your website. These are things like your social media platforms. These are things like reviews. So that's building credibility or diminishing it. We got to make sure that we're increasing or building our credibility once they've found us. Staying top of mind, isn't it fair to say that a, uh, a homeowner you know, or, or somebody who owns a rental property or a community may have found you in January but may not be ready to work with you until June or July for any different reason? How do we stay top of mind with our prospects until they become customers? 
We want to do that without frustrating or annoying them. And social is a great way to do that if we are truly adding value to them as opposed to just promoting what we do or our products and services. Okay? So that's staying top of mind. Driving them to their sweet spot is a, is a reminder to us any time that we're doing any kind of marketing or, or uh, sales, especially on social, we want to know where we still close business. So for example, in your world, my guess would be that you end up closing a sale or officially gaining a customer either maybe at their home or their property if you've gone out and seen them, or maybe in your office if they come and see you, right? So that's your sweet spot. And no matter if you're doing an email marketing piece, a social uh, posting or even an advertisement on, on Google or on Facebook or Instagram, you want to make sure you're still driving them to your sweet spot, the place that you actually do business. Because if you're missing that last part, you're not going to see as much success on social uh, without it. So you want to be really careful with that. Make sure you're continuing to drive them to the place that you close business or close deals. Does that make sense? That's driving them to your sweet spot. The last two... I would say are equally, if not the most important than any of these, strengthening relationships. You may have a person that has uh, brought a lot of apartments to you guys or homes to you guys, basically a long-standing client or customer. Are they only hearing from you when you need something from them, or are you building relationships with them? Social is a great opportunity to be able to kind of um, erase the, the, the you know, business colleague versus business colleague and actually create friendships or relationships with people. And so some of my best clients in the world have become personal Facebook friends of mine. And I know that may sound scary to some of you, but I also am able to see when they have challenging times. Maybe a, uh, a loved one is sick, or maybe, um, you know, they, uh, you know, had a, a tragedy, you know, in their family or something to that effect. Or there's the other side, you know, a, a, a child just graduated college or, you know, they just had an anniversary uh, with their wife or their husband. You know, these opportunities to be able to either uh, console them if, if there's a challenge or something that's happening or be able to support and, and show appreciation if something great has happened is a way to be able to, to build that relationship and strengthen that relationship. And a huge part of social that oftentimes gets overlooked. So just something to think about. And then last but not least, earning referrals, the holy grail of social. Meaning, you know, when somebody is a proud or champion customer of yours and they say, you know, hey, Gail, I just want to let you know, you guys have rocked it when it comes to managing our properties. I, I rarely ever hear from you unless you really need something. It's been fantastic. And you're the only one to hear that testimonial. We got to change that. That's the beauty of social. If we can get that person to post that online in some form or fashion, now hundreds, if not thousands of people have the opportunity to see that. So that's no different than the olden days of word of mouth. A lot of you might tell me that word of mouth is the way that you get new clients or new customers. Well, social is just word of mouth on steroids. The opportunity to be able to grow that even more. So the bottom line is, and the reason I always start with this, is anything that we talk about or anything that you do on social moving forward, I want you to make sure it falls into one of these categories. And if it doesn't, you need to consider why you're doing it. Because part of your frustration is you do things on social or we, your team does something on social or digital and you see no results because you're not, you don't know why you're doing it. Hey, we just created a Snapchat platform. Why? Right? So we got to think about that. Speaking of Snapchat, let's talk about that for a second. So one of my big things in socials to keep it simple. So I'm a big proponent of not doing everything at once or all the, the social sites and doing a few very well and really being strategic on what we focus on and what we don't focus on. So I want you, my first sort of best practice for you is to be careful of the shiny new penny syndrome. When a new social site comes out, we immediately think we need to be there and that's just not the case. So the best example I can give you guys of that was I had a presentation similar to this and I was talking about a social strategy and somebody asked me about Snapchat. And I started talking to, to her about Snapchat and the benefits to it, whatever the case may be, and a gentleman made a sound of frustration that I had never heard before. It was like totally interrupted the entire speech and it was just like out of the blue. And I didn't know what, had, what, what the reason was for it. And he was just so frustrated 
with yet another sight that he had to focus on that he just burst it out. So this is what I found. The best way I can kind of share with you what it sounded like uh, was what this guy sounded like when I started talking about Snapchat. So I said to the guy, I was like, you know, I mean, this really happened. I was like, whoa, what's going on, man? He's like, I, I apologize for the outburst. You know, I'm just frustrated. I said, well, why are you so frustrated? And he said, well, I, you know, I thought I had, you know, my hands around Facebook and Instagram and LinkedIn and maybe even Twitter and Pinterest and all these other ones. And then Snapchat comes along. Yet another site that I got to figure out. And I said, okay, well, let's talk about that for a second. I think that's probably a question a lot of people in the room have. Tell me a little bit more about your business. And he said, well, I sell medical supplies to the elderly, elderly like being like 75 or above or whatever. And I was like, well, gosh, you know, that's strange because if you look, you can do an easy Google search on demographics of social, you'll plainly see that the largest demographic of Snapchat is aged 12 to 17. Even if you multiply that by like three or four, you're still not there in terms of a demographic, right? You don't need to be on Snapchat. Congratulations. Unless your audience is anywhere between 12 and maybe 23, Snapchat's at least not the top priority for all of you. Is that fair? I'm letting you say no to Snapchat. Congratulations. Good night. So my whole book is called Social Media Overload, and the whole thing about it is figuring out where you should be and planting your flag there, and you don't need to be everywhere. Does that mean there's, there's not a case for Snapchat or maybe Twitter or LinkedIn or even Pinterest? Maybe, but I'm talking about prioritizing and focusing on two or three and doing them really well. So my second best practice for you is don't be a jack of all social media sites, master of none. Instead, focus on a few and do them really well. So, of course, the question that you're going to have is, well, which one should I focus on? Well, this is a, and again, I'm going to share this with you. You're more than welcome to take a picture of it, but I will share my slides with you at the end. But this is just a snapshot of who is on each of these channels. And just to give you the Reader's Digest version, Facebook is the only social network in the billions right? And yes, the age group tends to, to trend older. And I say older, you know, 35 and above. The, and, and that doesn't mean the young millennials and such aren't on it, but some of them are opposed to it for different reasons, and they move elsewhere. And we'll talk about it in just a second. But it is the large behemoth in the room. Most likely, your customer base is there, and that's the one I want you to put number one. Now, the funny thing is, the people who leave Facebook tend to go where? Instagram, right? And you might be saying, ha, 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 slap you in the face, Facebook, I'm going to Instagram. Well, who owns Instagram? Facebook, right? So they're like, ha, ha, you know, back at you, right? So, yeah, I think Instagram's a good place for you. The millennials are there, ages 35-ish and below, um, and it's starting to trend upward. And it's a very visual site. It works very differently than Facebook. And there's some opportunities for you. So I'd probably put that too. Um, I mentioned Snapchat. I don't think that that's up at the top. Twitter, in our experience as an agency, has not done a lot for our businesses in terms of generating results. So I put that lower on the totem pole. I see that as a great information gathering platform. If you're looking to share information on your social channels and you want to use that as a resource, great. But as far as you spending resources and time promoting that platform, I'd put it below Facebook and Instagram. Uh, LinkedIn's a great tool. I love Instagram or LinkedIn. But when I thought about you guys and I think about what your client base is, it may not be the right environment for you. It's a very B2B network. A lot of Fortune 500 companies, recruiters. Um, it's a very safe environment for high-level executives and professionals. The question is, is that your customer base? You have to ask yourself that question. My assumption or based on my research from you guys, I'd say no. Then I'd put that at a lower priority. So my top two for you guys are Facebook and Instagram. And that's what we're going to focus on today. Okay? You get to at least uh, lower the priority of the rest of these. So where should you plant your flag? I mentioned Facebook and Instagram, but that's not all. 
I'm, I'm giving you guys a pass on some of the social sites that demographics are not your, you know, they, they are not your demographics, but there's some other places. Now, I'm, I'm partly a customer of yours. I've, I've owned a decent amount of properties in my lifetime. My father, who happens to be in the room today as well, owns some property. In fact, he is working with a property manager right now in Sarasota, Florida. And so, you know, part of, besides the word of mouth, what we do is I kind of had to go back to the old school, and it's still a very uh, important uh, strategy for you guys, and that's, you know, Google searching. You know, when we don't know who you are and we don't have a recommendation, the place that we probably go to find you guys is the largest search engine in the world, Google, right? So we need to talk about that for a second. So my step two for you guys in this sort of process is don't be a Google ghost town. And I did a lot of research on you guys, and this is definitely an opportunity. So I'm letting you guys uh, sort of let go of Snapchat, maybe uh, LinkedIn and, and Twitter, but I really want you to take that extra resource and time and focus it on Google. Now, when I did a search here, I did property management Orlando. Let me give you guys just sort of the lay of the land here. Those first four uh, sites that you see at the very top, those are ads. People, uh, companies like yours are paying to play there. So let's talk about that for a second. Do I recommend you paying to play on Google? Here's the thing. With your worlds, there's only a very few search, key search terms that are most important. I want you to think about that for a second. If somebody doesn't know who you are, and they've got their coffee, and they, are, they own a couple properties, and they're ready to have someone manage it or a company manage it. What are they typing into Google to find that, that company? Property manager in San Diego. Who, what, what, what did you say? You're shaking your head. What was your same similar thing, but different location. Property manager. Anyone else come up with a different term other than property manager? Rentals. So if they're looking for rental community, like houses and such. What was another one? Sometimes what? Evictions. Okay, so that's kind of a different angle. Yep. It's true though. I hear you. I hear you. I hear you. No wrong answers here. So what I want you to do, not now. Oh, yeah, one more. Yes. So let me answer that question really quickly. And I know a lot of you have that, so that's an important question. You have the owner side, the property management side, but you also have the tenant side and that side. And you almost feel like you have to have two different companies. You don't have to have two different companies, but you can have two different sections of your website to be able to send them to. And the beauty behind Google is if you do your optimization properly, the link that shows up on Google, can act, on Google can actually take them directly to that section of your site. Okay, does that answer your question? So, and then from an advertising standpoint, you would obviously advertise the link to that particular part of your website. Okay, and the homepage might be sort of a directional, what we call a directional site, which essentially, if they get to your homepage, you say, "Are you a tenant?" You go this direction. Are you a property owner? You go this direction. Okay. So going back to the ads for a second, I want you to think about what that most important search term is and then do it and then see if you see yourself on page one. If you don't, you may consider advertising there to be there. It's, a, it's the fastest way to get to the top of Google. Now, do you have to pay money? Of course you do, but it's per click. So it might be a dollar per click. It might be 75 cents. It might be a dollar 50 per click, but at least you're showing up. And then over time, especially for some things I'm about to give you organically, meaning free, if you start to show up on the free side of Google, maybe you lessen that ad budget a little bit. But if you have these critical keyword searches and you are a Google ghost town there, it might be a good idea for you to look into some Google ads, okay? That's my, my strategy or my recommendation on advertising. Right below the ads are what is called a directory, and it's Google's local directory. Now, do you guys find it weird or strange that every time you do a search on Google, the first directory that always comes up is what? Google's directory. Well, Google, it's Google. They own the search engine. They can do whatever they want. So their listings come up first. Below that, you might see other directories, and we'll talk about that in just a second. But your Google local listing is a critical, look at that. 
If somebody's doing a search for property management in your city, right below the ads are the local listings. So my second action step for you guys is to go look at your local listing on Google and see what it says. Is the phone number right? Is your address correct? Does the description match exactly what you guys do? Is the website link right? And how do the reviews look, which we'll talk about in just a second. But get very familiar. Forget Snapchat and focus on your Google local business listing. Okay? It's right there up at the top. So that's important. And then directories, which I'll go to the next screen here for a second. These are ones beyond Google Local. Now, obviously, again, I, um, you see Google Local there, but what are the other directories that tend to show up on page one of Google when you type in property management and your location? Is there another one that you guys are thinking of? Yelp. Yep, yelp, yep. Uh, and whenever I say Yelp, usually people are like, oh, you, I hate Yelp, you know, and I know, I know there's a lot of challenges with Yelp. They're kind of like the search directory mafia, some people call them and such, but... They're out there, um, but think of some of the other directories. And here's a great little tip for you when you're thinking about which directories to focus on. Do this search. If it shows up near the top, focus on it. If it doesn't, don't. Make sense? So if Yelp is there all the time, that's what your searchers are seeing. If Kudzu or um, uh, I I the other one, uh, what's the one where you, know, uh, you can do the search and see a price for a house? Zillow, I see that a lot. Whatever. Whatever you see at the top of the page is what you should focus on. But if uh, Joe Schmo comes in off the street and says, hey, man, we're Blue Pages. We're this new directory. We show up all the time, and you guys got to pay us to be on our directory. And you just go to Google, and you do a search, and you don't see them. Why? Why would I do that? Why would I do that? And walk them right out the door. Okay? So focus on the directories that show up at the top of Google. So let's talk about uh, negative reviews for a second. So again, this is something I looked at from you guys, and most of you have reviews online. Now let's, let's, let's understand where they can show up. Google has a review area. Your local business has reviews. Yelp has reviews. Facebook has reviews. So there's lots of different places for customers to review you guys. And I know this is something that um, is concerning to a lot of you because I did see a lot of negative reviews out there, and that happens. It's not, a, it's not a knock on your company that you get a negative review. That happens. The question is, what do you do about it? And how do you respond? So let's talk about that for a second. You can see right here, and I'm not picking on anybody, and I just chose a random example, and it's probably hard to see, but I just want to tell you, just so you guys understand how important this is, I typed in property management in o Omaha and Nebraska, and very quickly, from a credibility perspective, I am making a decision. You guys can see it without even telling you. Right? You see that up there? Some of it looks good and some of it doesn't look good. And that's not a knock on that particular property management company. Many of you have negative reviews. That's not the point of showing you this slide. The point of showing you this slide is that they only have one, I'm sorry, they have two reviews. So if you only have two reviews on such a large site like Google Local Business, if you get a negative review, that negative person has a lot of onus or emphasis on what they said because you only have two. My question back to you guys is, how many champion customers you have out there? How many, prop how many property owners love you guys? How many times have you had somebody shake your hand and be like, Steve, I just got to tell you, man, you guys rock. Your company rocks. Your employees rock. We love you guys. We're going to keep working with you to the end of the day. And you say, thank you very much. And you walk away. That's a review you got to ask for a Google review from that. So when I come back here next year, and I look at all these, of those of you guys that were in this room, I expect to see 15 or 20 champion reviews on Google. Not from Cousin Mary or Sister Sally, but from actual real champion customers. Because people are more motivated when they're unhappy than when they're happy. Do we know that? Especially on social, people are more motivated when they're unhappy than when they're happy. So we have to encourage, we have to literally hold the hand of people who are happy customers to review us. Here's uh, an example on Facebook. 
of reviews. You can see that's a positive impression, 4.6 out of five stars. That's good. So if you guys do a great job of getting positive reviews on Google and Yelp, move over to your Facebook page and encourage your customers to review you on your Facebook page. But this is something I strongly encourage you to do because it is literally either winning or losing you business right now as we speak. So about those negative reviews, a couple of best practices there. Don't be defensive. If you get a negative review, sleep on it. Don't uh, react emotionally because what a lot of people who write reviews, especially negative ones, are looking to do is to fight, to get in there and battle with you, and that just makes you look bad. So instead, what I want you to do, do I want you to respond to it? Absolutely. I want you to respond to that negative review, and I want you to try to help them because here's the cool thing. You can actually turn a critic into a champion. Something may have gone wrong that you didn't know about, and you can try to fix that problem. And if you're able to fix it, they can go back on there and say that you fixed it. And they've actually shown studies. This actually was done on Comcast. That Comcast went from terrible, awful customer service to kind of shitty customer service. Sorry. But like they lowered the level of their um, customer service level to a better degree only by being better at responding. Not that they got less negative reviews, but just that they responded better to those negative reviews in not a defensive way, but just an, an empathetic way, all right? So that's what I want you to do. Try to fix it, and if you can't do it, take it offline. Try to phone call with them. Try to meet with them and try to solve the issue, and if you can't, let it die. But again, the thing I want you to think about more than those negative reviews is how can you get more positive ones? As I mentioned before, people are more motivated to review a person or business when they're unhappy than when they're happy. We must be proactive in requesting reviews from champion customers. Is this helpful so far? We've got more to go. Timing is everything on those reviews, by the way. Just a quick uh, reminder that, you know, if you've got a happy client or a customer, get them while they're happy. Don't wait a month or six months later because they're just not as motivated. So you want to get them... Um, you know, when they mention that, that, that testimonial. But the thing I want you guys to write down or burn into your brain, and I want you to share this with all of your employees, never let a verbal testimonial go unpublished. Never let a verbal testimonial go unpublished. Can I get an amen? amen. Yeah, it's a big one. I'm guilty of that too, by the way. I mean, we all need to do a better job on that. Okay, let's move to your website for a second. Another platform that people go to um, I don't want you to wind up on websites that suck.com. That's an actual real website that you can actually show up on. In fact, I did a, um, I did a little research on you guys, and I, uh, I looked at all your websites, and I've decided to show you now the one that I would nominate for websites that suck.com. I didn't tell any of NARPM that I was going to do this, so it's a little bit of a risk. So, ladies and gentlemen, I give you, I'm just kidding. I would never do that to you guys, man. Just want to kind of bust your chops there for a minute. I wouldn't do that to you. The, the, the faces, I could even see them in the back and right here, man. I was about to, my career was about to close really quickly. I would never do that to you guys. I wouldn't do that. And in fact, yeah, no, no, no problem. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, but in fact, in all honesty, I did look at your sites, and most of them are pretty good. I was pretty impressed. You guys are really kind of working on modernizing your websites. But just in case, I just want to give you guys a few things. Write them down, take a picture of it, or take the slide and show it to your team and just be thinking about it in 2018. If you're kind of lagging on a few of these, I want you to make sure that you do them in the next few months or so. So here are some of the best practices. So again, this might be one of your sites, not the one I nominate. The only sites I put up here of yours are the ones I was actually really impressed with. And I'll show you examples. So responsive design. What that basically means is, when you guys leave here, I want you to go to your website on your cell phones. And I want you to do the thumb test. I want you to be able to navigate your entire th site without moving your four fingers, just your thumb. That's the thumb test. And if you can't do it, you need to become more responsive than you already are. Because a lot of your prospects are checking your sites out on their mobile phones. And they're actually not using their four fingers. And people don't like to do this and, you know, this and all this. They, you know, they just want to use their thumb. So make sure that if you're on a, a cell phone, that you can fully navigate the site. You can call the phone number and do all the things that you want to do from your thumb. 
And if not, fix it. Okay? Another one that is a common mistake I see is critical information above the fold, meaning that people don't have to scroll to see it. What would you guys say, if you had 10 visitors to your website, what's the common thing that they're always looking for on your website? Just shout it out to me. Properties, great one. What was another one? Pricing, what? Qualifications, like I call that social proof, like why you should win their business over somebody else, testimonials, years in business, that type of thing. Is that what you're thinking? Oh, I'm sorry, application qualifications. So that's another good one. But social proof are just some things that you could do to um, win their business. Yes, sir. Say? How to contact you. Phone number is a common one I always see missing on websites. So this is a good example. You see their phone number. You see their so social media sites. Let me give you a little um, extra best practice on social sites. And a lot of you miss this one, but everybody misses this one. Don't put a social site on your website that you're not actively managing. For example, if I went to the Google, a lot of you have the default ones. Nobody's doing Google as a search, en or, I mean, sorry, as a social network anymore. But yet we all have it as a social link on our site. So if you let people go there, there's an opportunity to diminish your credibility. Just remove it. Only have the social sites that you're actively managing and get rid of the rest. There's no reason to send them somewhere you don't want them to go. Okay? A proper opt-in strategy. So I got a super ninja tip for you guys because I've had a, uh, a love-hate relationship with opt-in pop-ups. So here's the deal. How many of you know what I'm talking about when you go to a website and somewhere in the, the uh, journey on the website, a, an opt-in pop-up comes up? Hey, will you sign up for this email list? And it interrupts your experience. Have you seen that before? Frustrating, isn't it? Annoying, isn't it? Highly effective, though. <laughs> Highly effective. So that's always been the love-hate relationship I have with them, and I finally figured out the best of both worlds. The problem with those is they come at the wrong time. Oftentimes, you go to a website, and they immediately hit you with that, and you weren't ready for it. So there's something called, and I want you to write this down, an exit pop-up. Now, an exit pop-up is cool because it only shows up when somebody starts to go out of your website and click the X button. And right before they leave, boom, wait, 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 before you go, here's something of value in exchange for your email address so I can stay in touch with you. That's awesome. Okay, so they were leaving anyway. You interrupt their last-minute experience with an exit pop-up and watch your email addresses go up instead of it, this being over on the side where they never look at it. Cool? Try that. You'll love it. And then just the last thing I'll mention is just high-res professional imagery. So a big thing that we see nowadays is, you know, images are so important on, on social and just on websites in general. So just make sure your photos are crisp, they're high resolution, they're professional. And you know, in a perfect world, and I go back and forth on this a little bit, they're real. You know, in your industry, could you use, um, you know, uh, uh, sort uh, uh, stock photos and such? You could get away with it, maybe more so than some of the other industries I've been in. But in a perfect world, I'd love for you guys to figure out some ways to create some authentic, real high-res photos. Maybe a a, a shot of your staff or your team, maybe a shot of some of the um, properties that you manage, uh, you know, or whatever the case may be. But we can tell when it's stock imagery. Again, it's not the worst thing in the world. I prefer that over, um, you know, really small cutout kind of amateur looking photos because it does diminish your credibility a little bit. Again, if you have questions, go ahead and type them into the, uh, the what's it called again? Slido. You'd think I'd know that, but Slido. Here's another one. Again, I know this is, this is probably a stock image, but really nice looking imagery. I mean, it gives you that warm, fuzzy feeling. Uh, and another thing just to watch out for, the whole six by nine thing, you immediately know a website is dated when it, 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 it looks like the little uh, square and there's like lots of room in the screen, okay? So be really careful of that. It needs to now fill the whole screen, 16 by nine, okay? So when you go to your website, if you see a bunch of empty space, <laughs> It's time for a modernization of your website. It's time for an update. Okay, let's talk about content for a second because in the world of social, content is uh, the hardest job we have 
in, 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 in all of what we do in social media is creating compelling content. So I want to give you guys a couple of strategies. Again, I don't want to jump in the weeds. I know you guys aren't posting Facebook every day. I know you're not posting Instagram images, but I want you to think about some of these as best practices to take back to your team and let them implement some of the stuff that we talk about. So one of the things that we do and one of the big best practices that we do in our agency is we create content calendars for our, the clients that we work with. And this gives not only us something to kind of sink our teeth on, but it also gives our clients. So let me give you an example of that. Every Monday is Community Monday. I, I, I created this for you guys. So every Monday is Community Monday. Every Tuesday is Testimonial Tuesday. Every Wednesday is Why You Wednesday. Thank you Thursday and Fridays are for closers. And again, this is just a random example. But if you did this, this tells the, the company that you're working with or your employees and you guys that every Monday you're going to talk about something in the world of your community. Because you guys are all local businesses. And part of what you uh, can add value to, to me and to other um, real estate investors or tenants or whatever the case may be, is to be a community resource for me. What events are going on in your area? Um, you know, what, uh, what are the best restaurants to go to? What, you know, Sarasota is my hometown. What are the, you know, we're, we're at the best beach in the world. And, and show some love for Siesta Key Beach or whatever you want to show some love for in your local town. But that's community. Testimonial Tuesday just means that you have to, on Tuesday, share a testimonial from one of your happy clients, which is going to force you, by the way, to get more of them, which is great. Why You Wednesday is a, um, a, a did you know why it's important to work with a property manager instead of doing it yourself. So every Wednesday, you share a best practice or a case study of why you should never go it alone. And this could be, and by the way, this could be a, a written post, this could be an, a, a, an image, or it could be a video. Thank you Thursdays. You might thank a, um, a partner of yours. You might thank a, a, a client or a customer of yours, but it's all about showing love to somebody else other than you guys. And then Fridays are for closers. Let me show you guys a couple examples of this. Community Monday. So I went to some of your Facebook pages, and this says, although snow is in the news in Seattle, it's not too early to think about and plan a state park visit. Ten state parks near Seattle with cabin rentals. Great resource. Love it. Only seven likes. I'm going to talk to you guys about that in just a second about engagement. But that was more likes than um, the other six or seven posts of that week got. So when you're talking about things in, that we're interested in, you're going to get more engagement. Testimonial Tuesday, we do this for a lot of our clients. We create nice images. Uh, y'all, I'm from Atlanta, the South, so it's y'all. Y'all treated my clients like family, wonderful experience from a valued client, so it's Testimonial Tuesday. Uh, thank You Thursday is, we did a big thank you to First American Title for their 20th anniversary wishes in the week of Atlanta's business. So we just gave love. We tagged them, which shows some love to other businesses, which, by the way, brings more traffic to us, so there's a little bit of strategy in that. So that's thank you Thursday. And then when I mention close on Friday is to remind people that now's the time. So in this particular case, these were a bunch of hotels, and they said spring break is just around the corner. Have you booked your hotel yet? So how would you do that? How would you make a kind of a strong call to action to people who may be waiting to get a property manager? You know? Um, are you tired of checking the toilets? Are you... You know, are you, are you tired of dealing with tenants? You know, um, you know, something that may just spur some motivation for people to take the next step. That's what Fridays are about. Fridays are for closers. Okay? So that's some content strategies for you guys. A couple of best practices. I don't, again, I don't want to get in the weeds, but just think about with hashtags. Hashtags are a way to keep the conversation around your brand in front of you. So let's just say Instagram for a second. You should have, and I want you to take this back with you, you'll blow the minds of all of your employees if you come back and say, we need to have an anchor hashtag. What? What is an anchor hashtag? That simply means that you guys need to have a hashtag for your brand. That's called an anchor hashtag. And anytime somebody posts anything online, ask them to use that hashtag. It's something you guys create, and that way anytime somebody posts on social, and they use that hashtag, you can see it. Because the, the, the fear is, is somebody goes to Instagram and says, man, I love ABC Property Management. Man, they are awesome, and you will never see that post. But if you remind people week in and week out to use hashtag 
ABC property management, then all of a sudden you have inventory of everything anyone says online. That's an anchor hashtag. Okay, so just when you guys are at the bar tonight and you see somebody, you know, and they're the millennial and you'll be like, hey, so what's your anchor hashtag? They'll be like, damn, smart people there. Woo. <laughs> or nerd or whatever the case may be. But um, so you and your customers use a brand hashtag consistently. Like I said, PMC Denver, I used one of your guys' example. Another hashtag that you can do is community hashtags. So it might be an event that's going on. They, they always have a hashtag. NARPM has a hashtag I've been using. That's how I've stayed in touch with you guys, using your hashtag. So, it, you know, I don't want you to get like, oh, gosh, he talked about hashtags. I'm so confused. Just know it's a way to stay in touch with the content that's being produced online. It's a way to stay in touch with the content, okay? That's what that means. Okay, real quick, we got a couple more, and then I'm going to open it up for some questions. Uh, creative use of video and imagery will directly impact your level of engagement on Facebook and Instagram. So what does that mean? If you're not already, written content is a thing of the past. It's video and images, video and images, video and images. You've got to be thinking about how you can use video and images in your content to take it up to the next level. Just straight written content, it just doesn't work anymore, even on LinkedIn. One of the most like, you know, even they have live video now. Even they get more in, in, uh, engagement with imagery and things of that nature. So really important. Um, there's a tool that I'm really bullish on in 2018 for Facebook. It's called Facebook Live. How many by raise of hand have either used or seen Facebook Live? Most of you guys, okay. And part of the advantage to it, let me just show you from a user perspective. How many of you have been on Facebook and you've been navigating Facebook, and all of a sudden in the right-hand corner it says, Steve Smith is live. And you're like, why in the world are they telling me that Steve Smith is live? I barely ever interact with Steve. And yet they're taking up my screen for this. Well, Facebook is pushing Facebook live. And if fa Facebook is pushing something, we as marketers have to listen. That's the way it works. So that's their big feature for the next year or two. So we should capitalize on it. When you go live, as either your company or as a person on Facebook, it's going to show it to everybody else. So we're trying to get our companies to take advantage of this feature that is, is really popular on Facebook. Now here's the challenge of Facebook Live. Let me be very, very clear. What you do on Facebook Live is you go live. You literally take out your phone or computer and you go live. That doesn't mean that you clicked it and go, all right, so in a little bit, let's go ahead and edit some of this. I said a couple ahs and, you know, I had to, you know, run to the bathroom real quick or whatever. No, it's live. Like, you can't do that. It's live, okay? So just, uh, have I mentioned that it's live? Just want to be very, very clear. It's live. So don't do that. But I will tell you that it's, it's a very powerful tool. It's live at first, but a question I get all the time is, once you click done and you click publish, it does become a recorded video that you can now use to share in different platforms and such. So it doesn't go away. It just starts out as live. So something that Mark Zuckerberg said is uh, he's made it repeatedly clear his intention to transform Facebook to a video first platform. One executive at Facebook went so far as to say that the app will be all video by 2021. So it's something for us to take seriously. There's two ways to do video on Facebook and Instagram, live and recorded. And there's advantages and disadvantages to both. Obviously with recorded, you have the opportunity to take takes and edit and, and you know, have an intro and an outro and make it look really cool, but you won't get as much engagement. Facebook Live, on the other hand, way more engagement, opportunity for people to comment live, which is really cool, but no opportunity for editing. You gotta be ready to go. Okay, that's the difference. So let me give you guys some ideas. I thought about you because I know that this is something that you're like, well, what are we going to go live about, Corey? Well, what are some frequently asked questions that you guys get from homeowner, homeowners and investors all the time? Couldn't you set up your computer maybe with you and somebody else and say, you know, a question we get all the time is blank and answer that question or three or four questions, real questions that you guys get all the time that would really add value to me as a homeowner or investor. Things I need to know as I'm about to embark on a tenant-owner relationship. Great Facebook Live content. A virtual tour of maybe a new home 
or apartment building that you have that you, you know, are, are either renting out or something like that. But bring people behind the scenes of part of your business. Partner interviews. Maybe you interview a real estate agent or a mortgage broker about what's going on in the, um, the, the real estate world of your county or your city. Or highlight an investor owner. Ask them to come and share some of their expertise, and you can do that in a Facebook Live environment. Now, these are all pre-promoted videos. That's the key here. You don't just go live. You promote it. You say, next Tuesday, we're going to go live, and we're going to talk to Steve Smith, who's been uh, a real estate agent here in uh, Jacksonville, Florida, for 20 years. And he's going to talk about what he's seeing in the marketplace and some of the things that come as tax laws change and whatever. Great stuff. A uh, question I get a lot on that is, should I do that on my personal page or my business page? The answer is wherever you get more engagement. So if you are laser focused on your business page, that's the place to go live. However, if you just happen to have a rock solid personal page on Facebook that you connect with lots of people who you do business with and all that kind of thing, do it from there. And if you get, you know, a, a concern I always get is, well, I get people say, stop talking about business on your personal page. It's your personal page. Well, that's probably somebody you wanted to disconnect yourself from since high school anyway. That's your excuse. Get rid of them. This is your life, man. This is your family's lifeblood. This is what puts food on the table. It's okay to intersect business and personal on Facebook. Just remember, turn it horizontal when you're shooting video, and it'll fill up the screen, especially on Facebook. Now, there's a couple caveats to that. Um, Snapchat, if you're a Snapchatter or an Instagram stories, they, they want you to go vertical. And sometimes if you're doing selfie videos, it makes sense to do it. So I don't think it's completely wrong 100% of the time. But if you're trying to do something professional and you're going from your phones, and especially if you're showing something else besides just yourself, definitely go horizontal. Another thing to think about in, when it comes to content marketing is winners in the digital marketing space are producers, not perfectionists. So you guys might be thinking about, you know, maybe we will do video this year. And you'll try to come up with the perfect video to knock people's socks off. I don't want you to think that way. I want you to do it consistently. I want you to go live once a month from Facebook or maybe once every two weeks if you really want to get aggressive. And do it consistently. People will be okay that it's not perfect, but they want to see something consistent. This whole um, episodic type of style of showing episodes that build on each other. It's, you know, it's Monday motivation again. We're going to be talking about blank. And last week we talked about this, and this week, you know, and kind of doing a series is kind of the way I'd like you guys to do it, you know, if you decide to, to take on this strategy. The last tip I got for you today, and then we'll wrap up, is just, I mentioned earlier about the lack of engagement that we see on Facebook and Instagram, and it's a challenge. It's a big challenge for businesses. Uh, Facebook's a publicly traded company, and they have to make money, and their, uh, their shareholders want them to make money, and so they are actively trying to make sure that us as businesses pay to play. So I just want to give you a couple ideas on how to do that, and then I'll leave it at that. So the three ways that we use advertising or money on Facebook and Instagram are the following. We do it on Facebook and Instagram, obviously. We boost posts, and we use it for remarketing. So boosting posts is very simple. You just you, you create a piece of content on, on Facebook or Instagram, and then you spend a little bit of money to boost it to an audience. So let me just give you an example. If you post something on Facebook and you just share it, and you say you have 100 fans on Facebook, only a tiny little percentage even have a chance to see it, maybe 10%. So you wonder why you only get three or four likes. Well, only about 10 people even had a chance to see it. But if you boost it, you spend a little bit of money, and they'll give you the, um, the, the money versus how many people will see it, you'll get more people to be able to visually see that post. And it could be anywhere from $5 to $50, depending upon how many fans you have. And it can either go to your fan base, or you can have it go out to additional people beyond your fan base and you can use demographics now I've said this a million times but now with all the things that are happening in the Facebook world this brings on a whole new conversation but when it comes to demographics Facebook has a lot of demographics on us and we can use that as marketers now they're going to be changing a lot of that based upon what's happened in the world right now but we still know age we know location we know interests 
we know male, female, we know income level, lots of stuff like that, that we can use to share our posts to these people. So that's boosting. The other one that we really like to use is called remarketing or retargeting. And for those of you who wonder what that is, all you have to do is think about Amazon. How many times have you gone to Amazon, searched for a product, and then gone back to Facebook, and lo and behold, there it is on the right, right? All, it's creepy, right? Happens all the time. Well, guess what? We can do it too. So if somebody goes to our website, we can drop a little sprinkle dust pixel from Facebook, and they, when they go back to Facebook, it can say, you can put like a, a, a running toilet or something and be like, still running that property on your own? You know, and just kind of remind them that you're there. It's a top of mind strategy. So we use that with our clients as well, and that's called remarketing or retargeting. I like to use it solely on Facebook, though, because people go there eight to ten times a day. Whereas if you remarket on other websites and such, they, they may or may not ever go back to those websites, but they're always going back to Facebook, and we can remarket there. So boosting posts and remarketing. Our clients tend to spend anywhere between $100 to $250 a month on social advertising. And if, if social media is going to be a strategy for you guys, you got to have budget. you got to have ad budget today in order for it to work for you. In summary, keep it simple. Facebook and Instagram are the places I'm telling you to plant your flags. Prioritize those directories. So Google local business, then maybe Yelp, and then maybe two others that you pay attention to. When it comes to reviews, listen, empathize, and then respond. Ask your happy clients to be social. Create compelling content. Be a resource for people. Don't just post stuff about you guys, but actually try to be a resource for the people that you are trying to create uh, relationships with. Video and images are the, the world of social now, and don't forget to boost those posts. I have my book here. Um, so I brought my dad with me. He's in the back of the room. And one of my dad's favorite things to do is sell books with me because it just makes him kind of feel like a celebrity. And so the last thing that I want to have happen is for us to go out there and we have like nobody coming up and saying hi or wanting to buy a book because it will ruin his day. I'm fine, but my dad will be severely disappointed. So I'm just saying. The other thing, and the reason I put my kids up here too, is um, this is how we buy diapers. So if you guys don't buy a book, I, they just will have diapers, which is fine. Don't worry about it. I mean, you know, and the last thing I'll say about the money, you know, we, we prefer cash, although I do have Square. In Vegas, I have to make like a really strong, honest point with you. The chance of your money actually leaving Vegas is pretty low. Uh, we're here for another two days. So it's kind of just like bypassing back to Vegas anyway. So just something to think about. Uh, what else? Thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, so fish where the fish are, as I mentioned before. Um, here's one thing I just want you to think about in closing. Uh, don't go it alone. Use resources. So your employees... Uh, an intern, or if you have the means, hire a social agency. If you want to talk to me about that, I've got business cards. I'm not here to sell you. You know, I, I, I love doing this. I love being on stage with you guys. But a lot of times we have people in the room say, hey, we just need someone to do it for us. My company is happy to talk to you about that. So don't go it alone. Uh, creativity wins on Facebook. This is the way we used to um, cook hot dogs at FSU, Florida State University, go Knowles. Uh, and that's just simply to tell you how weird I am. And that, you know, when you are going live on Facebook or posting on Facebook, try to be creative. Don't just, just you got to stand above the noise. It's a very crowded place. With that being said, do we have, uh, what is it? Randall. Where are you, Randall? I'm right here in the back, ready to go with questions. All right, my man, let's do this. If we get positive feedback in writing, do we need permission to use them as a testimonial on our website? I, first of all, I like this tool because I see why that raised up. Great question. Um, if you get positive feedback, and yeah, yeah, I mean, I'm not a lawyer, you know, and I, and I go, my life, my whole world is uh, better to ask for forgiveness than permission, but it's probably not a bad idea to get permission to post it from them, you know, uh, maybe written or whatever the case may be, but uh, if they're on video, here's a cool thing, if you get a video testimonial, just ask them on the video, do you mind if we post this on social? Yeah, yeah, totally fine. You literally have them recorded on video saying that, so that's good. So yeah, I would prefer you get permission from them before you post. If not, and you weren't able to do it, just use their first name and last initial, and you'll be fine. You haven't mentioned YouTube. Why? I didn't have enough time to mention YouTube. No, uh, YouTube is good. YouTube is good. I prioritize it under Facebook 
Because, you, you know, Facebook, Facebook attacks sites. Have you noticed that? They attacked, um, they attacked uh, a couple of the video, Periscope. They attacked uh, Snapchat with Instagram. And now they've gone after YouTube. And you will actually find, we've done studies on this, less engagement if you take a uh, video and post it on YouTube and then share it on Facebook versus posting it natively to Facebook. So when it comes to video, I prefer that you use Facebook as your native posting environment. Does that mean that YouTube's not a great platform? No, it's great. Owned by Google, we love it. But I prioritize uh, Facebook over YouTube. What is the best way to combat Yelp? Um, so I know that Yelp uh, filters out negative or positive reviews. They don't like you asking for reviews, and that bugs me because, again, I don't think that you're asking Sister Sally or Cousin Nancy to ask for reviews. You're asking for real customers to do that, but they do it. So what I do to combat it is if you ask 20 people to review you on Yelp, they're not going to uh, filter out all of them. They can't. They can't figure that out. They're not good enough to do that. So keep bombarding them with positive reviews, and some will get through. But stay authentic. Make sure they're real. Uh, but that's how I combat Yelp, is to overpower them with positivity. Great. If you are using video, how long should the video be? Oh, uh, so if you're doing like a pre-recorded video, short. We're in the ADD generation, so attention spans are tiny. So two to three minutes, at most five minutes. If you're going live, I actually encourage you to extend that out to 10 or 15 minutes because it takes some time for Facebook to build an audience for you. So don't be afraid to go long. People will come in and come out, and you can always edit the video later as a shorter video, but stay on for a while. And people will come in and come out, but make sure you have content to stay on for a while. So you'll have a bunch of bullets that you're going to cover on your Facebook Live video, but I'd say 10 to 15 minutes for a Facebook Live is, is, is a good, good time to go to shoot for. I've been told to post my, to my business Facebook and then share it to my personal page. Do you support that idea? I do, yeah. I, I have no problem with syndicating your content across all platforms. Just start it at the place that you do most business on. So again, if Facebook as the business page is your environment, great. But then share it to your personal. And get your employees to do the same. You're all in the same boat here. If you guys create a fantastic video with great value, and you as the owner are the only one to share, well, that's not, a, that's not good. Have everybody share it to their LinkedIn, to their Twitter, to their Instagram, you know, all kinds of places. Put it in your email. Put the video as a little square, but get as much leverage out of the video as you possibly can. Yes, I'm totally uh, game for syndication. How do you create an anchor hashtag? You just sort of create it and you start using it. There's no real way to like go to a website or do it. You just say, we are going to start using ABC property management. And from here on out, that's what you use. And then when you go to Instagram, there's a little search bar and you can actually type in ABC property management and see all the posts that have used that hashtag. But the way to create it is simply to start using it. What do we do about clients who want to leave a review but don't have a Yelp account? They get hidden. Uh, get them to go somewhere else. Don't force them down a, a platform that they don't use. They may not be a Yelper, but they may be a Google reviewer. They may be a Facebook user. Heck, they may be a Twitter user. Let them share it on Twitter. I'm good with that. You know, I mean, people use Twitter. People use Instagram. Figure out where they want to post it, where they are most comfortable, and let them post it there. Awesome. We have time for a couple more. Is it worth hiring a professional SEO company to boost your reviews and help get rid of the negative ones? Oh, that's a tough question. Um, yes, yes, yes. Uh, <laughs> it is, you know, I, I have, a, again, a love-hate relationship with some of that stuff because I don't, I don't want you guys by any stretch of the imagination to be taken advantage of. And so I think it's just one of those things to make sure that you are fully comfortable and understand what they're doing for you for the price that they're charging you. And if it's a one-time thing, understand that. If it's a monthly thing, understand what they're doing month to month to month. But it's never a good idea to pay for services that you don't understand. So make it crystal clear. And if they go above your head and you don't know what they're doing, don't work with them. You know, but I've seen too many times where you've been paying, you know, a couple grand a month and you just don't know what you're getting. And I don't like that. So yes, there's value to SEO companies, there's value to social media companies and all that, but be very clear on what you're getting for the price that you're paying. 
Corey, this list of questions is growing immensely. Do you have time for a few more? Can you run over a little bit? Uh, that's a question for you guys. The answer is yes. Okay. Is it, let's see. What is your opinion on using Craigslist for advertising and engaging with the community? Uh, I am not a, a huge Craigslist user or um, expert, so I, I have a, I'm not really the one to ask that question to. By raise of hand, is anybody having success advertising on Craigslist? A few, okay. Huh? Vacancies he has. Huh? Just to tenants. So there, there seems to be some, some results from tenants, but not really for the, the proper, finding the properties, it sounds like. Should we duplicate our Facebook content on Instagram, and is there a way to do, do that automatically? Yeah, so it, it, it's totally okay to syndicate. I call it syndication versus duplication, but that's fine. Uh, but just know that, you know, Facebook allows for content way more than Instagram does. So what we might do is we might post a, a really good piece of content to Facebook that's a little bit more heavy on written content. And then my team will take uh, images and post some of the best parts of that content overlaid on the image. So it's the same content, it's just posted differently depending on the platform. Uh, and if we have, like, let's say we do a blog article, the five reasons to hire a property manager. That won't work on Instagram. So instead what we'll do is we'll take those five tips and we'll post them with images one at a time on Instagram. That makes sense? So same content, different use on a different platform. Great. Is it possible to run a Facebook Live video from your company web page? No. Uh, company Facebook page, yes. Company website, no. Uh, I, where are you, uh, Randall? Right here, way in the back. Oh, oh, hey, okay. I was thinking you were like up there somewhere. I don't know. I just, <laughs> couldn't find you. Do ad blockers prevent the remarketing content from appearing on Facebook? Uh, no. They don't. Uh, Facebook's in charge of their own ad platform, and um, Facebook will always advertise to us, and uh, that's the, the game that they play of trying to keep it a, a, as good of a user experience as they can while also advertising um, and making money for their, for their customers. So, no, ad blockers is not a problem. Seems like we only get negative reviews, and a lot of our champion owners are technology challenged. We've removed the reviews from Facebook completely. Is that a bad idea? Interesting. Um, I would say it is a bad idea only because they'll go somewhere else and you have more control over Facebook than you do Yelp and your Google local business page because you, you, you essentially own your Facebook page. So I prefer that you open it up and allow for that dialogue to happen there. It's better to happen there, again, than other places. And, um, and try to work through that with them. And the other part of that question is if you have a technology challenge person who loves you, I would literally, like I said, handhold them to the computer, have them sign into Google, show them where to do it, sit behind them and just be like, uh, that is really nice of you to say, that, that is exactly what I was hoping you'd say. You know, I mean, literally just try to, uh, you know, help them through the process. It's that important. You know, you're, you're literally potentially losing business with those negative reviews, so we got to get them on there. Okay, two more. What are your thoughts on doing giveaways for five-star reviews? Hmm. These are good questions, folks. Um, I have no problem with it. It's really a personal preference type of thing uh, because I do believe in encouraging. You see it all the time. I went on a Delta flight and they asked me to review and we got a chance to win two free giveaways. That's, that's basically bribing me, right? Um, but you know, it's your own, you, you put your, pillow, your head on the pillow each night. So if you don't feel comfortable incentivizing or offering some sort of incentive for a review, um, that's fine, you know, but I, I, I've seen a lot of companies do it uh, and I'm okay with it. And, and, you know, and maybe it's like a Starbucks, it's a, instead of incentivizing in that if, if you give me a five-star review, then we'll give you, like with your kids, it's a way of saying it. It's thank you for the five-star review, here's a thank you, you know, we're going to provide you a thank you Starbucks card for your time. And you could probably offer that, you know, up front. So I'm okay with it, but just be a little careful with it. All right, last one. Thanks, Corey, for the extra time. What about Bing? <laughs> what? <laughs> no. Um, I, it's a prioritization thing. Bing's there. People use Bing. I got no problem with Bing. Google's bigger. Focus on Google. Uh, a lot of the things that you do on Google will um, 
replicate to Bing anyway, except for the advertising stuff. And if you're seeing great success with Google and you're getting leads and you're getting money in, you could try Bing. You're not going to probably see the same results, but you might see some results. So uh, I would prioritize Google over Bing. I really appreciate your time and energy today. You guys are awesome, man. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you.